This is a production of Cornell University. So, um, what I'd like to talk to you about is what I see as two very major issues where I think the US in particular can play a major part. That through innovations, I hope I can convince you that at least scientifically, we can play a major part in feeding the world and fueling the world um, from plants by 2050. But there are a number of social barriers, acceptability issues, which um, you know, we're also going to have to overcome and may be the larger challenge. But most of my talk will be on the science and why I think these goals are, are possibilities. So just um, like parts of Cornell, Illinois is a land grant university. Um, this is our Institute for Genomic Biology and I put this picture in because in front of it those maize plants are growing on the Morrow plots which is the oldest agricultural experiment outside of Rothamsted, England. Um, so maize has been grown there since 1876. So it's, if you like it's one of the longest sustainability experiments in existence. Soil samples have been taken every year so we can look at changes in soil properties and sustainability. Um, and this was Professor Morrow when he was setting these plots up um, almost 150 years ago. Um, we're so proud of the fact that like you we have alumni who are um, World Food Prize laureates, Mary Dell Clinton and Rob Fraley, um, who I think importantly were awarded the World Food Prize for their work on bioengineering of, of crops, which is perhaps quite a change in um, awards and maybe telling us about the role of new technologies in moving food production forward. So what I want to look at are really um, three issues, addressing food security and the global change and as um, Bob said at the beginning I'll be talking a lot more tomorrow about uh, global, global change and adapting to that and also the issue of whether we can have bioenergy without conflict with food production and then I'll finish briefly talking about some of the barriers as I see them to moving these opportunities forward. So addressing food security under global change. If we look at, um, I apologize this is data for 2013, but that's the most complete global data we have at present. If we look at the most important crops in terms of productivity of uh, food, primary foodstuffs, then today maize is number one. Um, over a thousand million tons produced in 2013. Um, for people stood up at the back, there are lots of seats here. Please, please come and sit down because it, standing up is a good way to keep awake during my talks, but it's uncomfortable on your feet. <laughs> so, so, so please feel free to come and sit down. So, um, so maize over a thousand million tons, rice next very um, closely followed by wheat and then soy um, a somewhat distant fourth but of course soy is an extremely important source of dietary protein both in animal feeds and in of course uh, food for us. Um, the United States plays a big part in the production of these crops although we only have a tenth of the world area devoted to maize in fact we produce over one-third of the world's maize. Um, we produce about a third of the world's soy and a significant part of the world's wheat as well. And the United States remains the biggest exporter of these primary foodstuffs. So what happens in the United States is actually very important for costs of many of these foods globally. So why with all that production, why should we be concerned? Well, 
Uh, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization report looking forward said, well, by 2050, we're going to have a third more people on the planet. But they are going to be far more urban than they are today. So we're seeing rapid urbanization. Diets in urban areas are historically different. They use more processed food, more animal products because people have a higher income. And so when you put those two things together, more people and different diets, they estimated that we'd need 70% more primary foodstuffs by 2050 than we have today, 30% more by 2030. And because there isn't that much more land than could support these primary foodstuffs, that would have to be achieved by making more per hectare of land. So are we able to meet this requirement? Well, if we look at what has happened historically, so this figure goes back to 1960, we can see what appears to be a fairly steady rise in the, the yields of wheat and rice. This is average global yields of these crops per hectare of land. So we can see that for both of these crops, it's more than doubled over that um, nearly 60 year period. So if we project that forward, we'd say, well, by 2050 we'll increase this much. But if we actually look at how much we need of these crops, then we need to be following this trajectory. And clearly we're, we're not at the present time. And indeed, this is beginning to go forward into the costs of these primary foodstuffs. So, for example, if we look at wheat prices um, back in 2006, about $130 per ton. By the end of 2013, they were $360. Now, I know everything has come down in price since that time, including gasoline. But this is at the beginning of March, it was still $312 per tonne. And this is considered to be a low in prices. FAO estimate that we're probably going to see a doubling of food prices, primary food prices, um, on a seven year cycle, given present trends. Now, we don't really feel that impact very much because these primary foodstuffs are really a very small part of the cost of what our household budgets. But in of course, some parts of the world, household budget, 60, 70% of it goes on um, basic foodstuffs. So if they double in price, that is a catastrophe for those, those areas. The other side of this problem is that we aren't really improving yields year on year the way we were. If we look at the percentage increase over previous decades. China, India and Indonesia are the biggest producers of rice in the world. If we look at their improvement in yield per hectare, then in the 70s and 80s, when dwarf cultivars were coming in from the Green Revolution, yields were improving 40% per decade. If we go forward now to the last decade, we're now into single figure improvement. This is despite the fact that countries like China are spending a hundred times what they were in the 80s on rice improvement. So more and more effort is needed and yet we're not getting the same return that we were. And indeed there's a fear that rather than going on a linear trajectory that we're actually getting into a stage where um, we're seeing a flattening out of yield improvement year by year. And of course, part of this may be impact of global change. Part of it may be that we're just reaching biological limits on some aspects of crop improvement. And this is a, another study which was looking at wheat yields through the world where some areas are showing improvement, but many, the yellow, are showing stagnation. And red is where yields have actually uh, collapsed. So in fact, wheat over the last decade 
the average yield of wheat per hectare of land has not improved at all. So why might this be? Why did we do so well in the Green Revolution and now we're struggling today? Well, um, I'll only put up one equation, and this is a simple equation, but I want to use it to explain why this may be. And this is looking at yield potential. So I, if, we have a, if we have a given variety of a crop, what is the maximum yield it can achieve at a site if there are no pests and diseases, we're giving it the nutrients and water it needs. So why might yield potential, improvement in yield potential be stagnating? Well, if we look at what determines yield potential, um, first of all, it's the amount of sunlight that's available during the growing season of that crop. Secondly, it's how good is that crop at capturing that sunlight? Thirdly, how good is it at converting that captured sunlight into biomass and how good is it then at partitioning that biomass into the parts of the crop we really care about so the grain of rice the seed of soybean and so on now these are some numbers for a modern soybean cultivar growing on a university farm where we've measured radiation interception we followed the growth of the crop and so we find is that actually the interception efficiency this is visible radiation because photosynthesis only uses visible radiation was 89% um, and 60% of the biomass ended up in the seeds so if you think about sort of putting a seed in the ground it's got to cover the ground really these figures are pretty remarkable already and it's hard to see we can make them any better. If our crop is going to have any more, if it's going to have some seed pods, it's going to have some stems to hold the seed, then getting much better than 60% seems unlikely. And this in particular is what we really changed in the Green Revolution. Many pre-Green Revolution rice and wheat cultivars had a partitioning efficiency of about 30% or a harvest index of 30%. Today they're around 60%. Interception efficiency has been improved as well. So these are perhaps theoretical maxima um, for interception and partitioning. This is what we achieve. But if we look at conversion efficiency, which is largely photosynthesis, then that falls far short of the maximum. And this is something that we appear not to have improved in uh, breeding for improved yield potential in crops. So do we know that if we did improve photosynthesis, we get any more yield? Um, what is the evidence we have for that? Well, this was something I was able to set up when I first moved to Illinois. Um, in 1999 we called it a face system and basically what these rings do and this was really to investigate global change is that this green you can see here now um, this I call it a ring but it's really an octagon these pipes release carbon dioxide according to wind speed and wind direction so if the wind is coming from this direction then CO2 is released so that it is blown across the ring and of course the higher the wind speed the more CO2 we release. It took about a year of engineering to get this right but now we can elevate CO2 to what we think will be the level in 2050. We put the apparatus in as soon as we've sown the crop and we keep it in place until the crop's dried down then we remove the apparatus so we can bring in small plot combines. So we achieve within plus or minus 10% of our target for pretty well 90% of the time. So the engineers managed to get it right. So within here, you've got elevated CO2. Now, carbon dioxide is a limiting substrate for photosynthesis. So 
um, photosynthesis, carbon dioxide plus light plus water gives you carbohydrate. CO2 is limiting, so if you give it more CO2, you get more photosynthesis. Does this give us more yield? Um, it gives us 25% more photosynthesis, and it gives us about 16% more yield in soybean, about 12% more in rice, 15% more, more in wheat. So we know that if we can boost photosynthesis, we can get more yield. And if we put this back into our equation, we can see conversion efficiency has gone up. This isn't measuring photosynthesis, it's measuring the amount of biomass we get per unit of light captured by the plant. And this ends up in significantly more, more yield. We've been doing this since the year 2000, and we routinely see these yield increases. Um, now, what I don't want to give you the impression is that, well, rising CO2 is good because that's going to give us more yield. Um, rising CO2 causes a lot of other problems, including rising temperature, order precipitation patterns, all of which are going to impact our crops. And we found many things that wouldn't have been predicted without doing these experiments. One of the expectations was that as CO2 rises, pest damage to crops would go down because there's more carbon and less nitrogen in theory. So insect pests have to work harder to get the nitrogen they need for their proteins. And this is the, one of the biggest pests of maize in the Midwest, the western corn rootworm. What it, what it does is in the fall, it will come into the soybean it will feed a little bit on the soybean and lay its eggs ready for the next crop because it's in a soybean maize rotation which this pest has adapted to and so it'll lay its eggs in soybean and so the thinking was well this would be less of a pest and indeed IPCC actually put that into its report it's in several publications but apparently these insects are illiterate and so they didn't know what they were supposed to do. And what we found was actually in elevated CO2, they laid twice the number of eggs. And if you combined rising ozone with rising CO2, the situation was even worse. And then um, my colleague, or colleagues Evan DeLucy and May Berenbaum looked at some other pests. And indeed, they found that Japanese beetle damage doubled, the insects live longer, they produce more young, and the same was true with the soybean aphid as well. So there are many unexpected impacts of rising CO2. But what it did show is, well, if we can boost photosynthesis, we can get more yield. So can we do that? Um, breeders really don't seem to have managed to select for more photosynthesis. There's a good reason for that. There's very little variation in photosynthesis in the germplasm. So can we intervene? Can we, perhaps through engineering, get more photosynthesis? And this is, I'd say, very timely because it appears to be the only remaining way we can get more yield potential. We can obviously improve disease resistance, agronomy and so on, but in terms of genetic yield potential, it looks like the only one of those three things we have left to improve. We know the process in a great deal of detail. It's probably the most studied of all plant processes. We know every step of the pathway, every gene involved, every protein involved, how they're assembled and so on. We also have high performance computing, which can allow us to simulate the whole process in silico. And crop transformation is becoming increasingly routine, even in the public domain. So I just want to give you sort of an example of that in, in practice. One of the things that um, my former student and now collaborator, Jing Wan Zhu, uh, conducted when he was doing his PhD was to take all of the hundred odd steps of the photosynthetic process and then describe them as a series of linked differential equations 
And of course, after two and a half years of work, we were eventually able to get this to start delivering something that in silico looked photosynthetically like the response of a leaf. Um, so the next thing you can then do once you have that is you can then say, well, okay, we're now simulating... Imagine this is like a car production line with many different steps. You can now simulate the whole thing in silico and you can say, okay, I have 100 workers on my production line. Where should I be investing those 100 workers? So what you can then do is apply an evolutionary algorithm which basically takes one step at random, takes away a worker or adds on a worker and sees whether it makes any difference to the system. Of course, 99 times out of 100, you're just making it worse. But every so often, you get one which makes it better. You keep that one, and then you go through the whole process all over again. Um, and I guess what I do like to say about this is, we always say it's not rocket science. But in this case, we could say it was rocket science, because what we're trying to do is numerically integrate a system of over 100 linked differential equations. And this is what, it's called a stiff system because some things are changing very rapidly, others are changing very slowly. And this person here, Eric de Sterler, was a, a mathematician who was working on the dynamics of balancing NASA rockets. And apparently that is a stiff system. And he'd found um, algorithms for dealing with these stiff systems and so we worked together with Eric to actually s solve this problem in simulating the photosynthetic system and we use his algorithm to the present day. So anyway, this is just a part of what the in silico simulation was telling us. So these are looking at enzymes involved in carbon metabolism. So when the plant has taken up carbon dioxide the processing of it, and the regeneration of the carbon dioxide acceptor. And what really stuck out, this is a logarithmic uh, base here, was that it said this enzyme, we should have 10 times more than we, we have. And if you come to the talk tomorrow, I can tell you why we think that is. But that then raised the question is, well, if you elevate this, do you really see more photosynthesis? So, I um, should say this is where it sits in metabolism. Here is the point, Rubisco, the enzyme, most abundant protein on the planet. It's the one that fixes carbon dioxide in plant leaves. And then that is uh, reduced to carbohydrate. And then it, it's an autocatalytic cycle. So it's adding carbon all the time. So carbon is coming in. Some is draining off as sucrose and starch, and the rest has to be recycled. And SBPase sits in this recycling phase. So it's a key enzyme. We, we know from reducing the enzyme that it can slow down photosynthesis. So if you increase it, can it give you more? And this is from my colleague in England, Christine Rains, that put this into tobacco, and here are her three different events with elevated SBPase enzyme and here is her untransformed material. So Christine showed that in the greenhouse in England and then we collaborated with Christine to put it back in the field in Illinois. We also tested in our face system as well and, and indeed in the field we were able to get more biomass produced by just this one manipulation. So we've really, as Bob mentioned, we've been looking theoretically at many other ways in which you might be able to boost photosynthesis. And then a couple of years ago, we were lucky that the Gates Foundation had been reading what we've been writing and sort of said in a roundabout way, well, how about we put our money where your mouth is and you show us whether you can really do this. And so... We, we're using tobacco as our test bed because we've got ideas coming from many different places. So we put those constructs into one cultivar of tobacco. 
regenerate those, and then put them out into replicated field trials to really find out which manipulation might give us more yield. And I'd just show you one of these that I've been working on. This is joint with uh, Chris Nayogi's group at University of California, Berkeley, where we showed in theory that if during the day the upper leaves of a crop are, get more sun than they can use, so they have to dissipate that absorbed sunlight, otherwise um, it will actually become toxic to the leaf. If they can't dissipate that sunlight energy, they start to bleach. And so what, Chris, um, what the leaf does is it then brings in quenchers, so molecules which can basically convert that absorbed light energy into heat. So it harmlessly loses that energy as heat. But, but if the leaf goes into the shade, for example, of a cloud, and now light is limiting, it's still dissipating that energy as heat. So and it takes about 30 minutes to an hour for it to recover and regain its efficiency. So we showed from a modeling perspective that this could, this could lower productivity by about 30%. And Chris Nayogi sort of read our paper and said, well, I think I've got a way to speed up this. So he sent us his constructs. We put them into tobacco. Um, and we, we checked that they did physiologically what we thought they should. And this shows that they're recovering. Um, so this shows that they respond far more rapidly than the wild type. Um, we could also pick those out with fluorescence imaging, which is another way we can look at this. But then, most importantly, when we put them in the field, this is really what they, the wild type look like, and these are his plants. And of course, I should say, though, all of these plants, if you boost photosynthesis, initially you see a response which is much better than the final yield, because during the exponential phase of growth, um, you're, it's like compound interest. Okay, if you get 1% more, that's compounded and the plant's growing faster. When the canopy closes, that compound interest no longer applies. But nevertheless, these plants were, the biomass was about 25% greater. So we're quite excited by that. And we've got others coming through um, this year. So now I want to move on to bioenergy. Why I think, so basically in that segment, I think that there are biotechnological ways that we could have a second green revolution, but it is biotechnology. Um, bioenergy has attracted a lot of interest. And of course, now what we're hearing is, well, hey, we're producing as much oil as we're, we're consuming. You know, the, the US doesn't have a problem, but I know I have two grandchildren, and I wonder, what is it going to be like when they, um, you know, when they want to do have a lifestyle like that we have? Is oil really going to be as cheap as it is today? Are we, as I believe, going to find this is really devastating for our environment, and we do have to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels? If those things hit then we really do need a bioenergy strategy. And to be realistic, to produce significant amounts of biofuels from plants, it's not going to be there tomorrow. If we want something in 20 years, um, we need to be starting today. So we shouldn't be looking at the situation today. We should be looking at the future. I, I personally feel, and this is a paper that Chris Somerville and I published in Science a while ago that really Brazil has been a model of doing this. They've, like the rest of the world, sugarcane in Brazil was in decline because the world decided it now had plenty of artificial sweeteners. There was less demand for sugar. We were using corn for making high fructose corn syrup. Probably not a good thing, but it was competing with, sh with sugar from sugarcane. So Brazil's sugarcane was in decline, as was the US's, as was the Caribbean. 
and then they had a crisis where they couldn't afford gasoline they decided to make ethanol from sugarcane and they really haven't looked back since they did that in 2012 was the first year in which a more gallons of ethanol were sold on forecourts in Brazil than, than gasoline. And indeed, they've also been exporting in some years as well. So they've managed to do this by really reoccupying abandoned sugarcane land and then also moving now onto some fairly low grade pasture and managing to restore that agronomically. So it really isn't competing with their food production um, in any significant way. And if you look, Brazilian government has now mapped out where you could grow sugarcane. So, so they've really ruled out areas that require deforestation, competition with food crops, um, uh, the, the Amazon region, the Pantanal region, and so on. Most of this land is really around Sao Paulo state, um, where of course they have the biggest demand for liquid fuels. But if you take that 60, nearly 64 million hectares and you look at how much ethanol could be produced, that would be about 15% of all global liquid fuel use. So it would make Brazil, if you like, the Saudi Arabia, um, a, a second Saudi Arabia, but with the advantage that they have a sustainable and re renewable and apparently indefinite if you like, oil well. Um, of course, we, in the 48 lower states at least, we can grow relatively little sugarcane. Although, I'd say we're underutilizing the areas where we can grow it. And, of course, Hawaii, which was a big sugarcane producer, has a lot of abandoned land, as does Puerto Rico, that could be used. But, of course, what has come onto the scene now is cellulosic ethanol, where we could make ethanol by digesting down cellulose and hemicellulose to release the sugars and ferment those to ethanol. And indeed, we're seeing the first commercial plants. Poet um, has its first commercial plant in Iowa, which is using corn stover to digest the cellulose down to um, glucose and the hemicellulose down to pentoses, and it's now using that for ethanol production. But if we think beyond our food crops, what this opens up is the opportunity to use almost any plant material. So it gives us an idea to reimagine agriculture. And this is a, a wish list of what our ideal crop would look like. It would be a C4 plant, because C4 plants are more productive, it would have a long growing season. It would recycle its nutrients. We don't need nutrients to make ethanol in our feedstock. So it's completely different to a food crop. And be productive on marginal, non-arable land where it won't compete with, with food crops. Um, so I just want to show you know, why our food crops are really not well suited to this task. Now, we're very proud of the productivity we get out of our maize plants in Illinois. But if we look at their use of, this is the course of solar radiation. This is how much the corn crop gets. So all of this is wasted. We, we also grow winter wheat. Does a good job of capturing this early season radiation, but then misses all of this. Perennials really do a, generally do a better job because this is um, a poplar. And of course, willows are similar. They already have reserves so that when temperatures become warm enough, they can expand their leaves very quickly and do a much better job of capturing radiation. And this is a, a grass, Miscanthus giganteus, which really fits these specs very well. And I should say, this is something I've worked on for 30 years, most of it in, in Europe where actually that table I showed you is not new. It's something we came up with in the first energy crisis over 30 years ago when we were asked by the European Commission to look at this issue. So this is, when I moved to Illinois, this student or 
now a professor in Iowa State, Emily Heaton, um, was in my classes and said, well, I want to try this plant in, in Illinois. So uh, we, we grew it. This one, this is the most we've seen, but this particular crop was 60 dry tons per hectare. So one of the biggest yields of anything in, in the Midwest in one year. Um, I said I'd grown it in England previously, and this is, this is in kilograms per meter squared. Multiply by 10 to get tons per hectare. That's a harvested yield of 20 tons per hectare, which is pretty well a record for um, Britain. But one of the big advantages of these perennial grasses, if you just want the biomass, is that they move their nutrients into the shoots as they grow in the spring. In the autumn or fall, they move those nutrients back into the perinating organs in the soil. So if you harvest them late fall or early winter, you're leaving the nutrients behind. And in fact, at Rothamsted in England now, this has been grown for 15 years. We've now added nitrogen. And if they do add nitrogen, they don't see a yield in increase. So very sustainable crops. Um, this is, these are our trials in Illinois where we're harvesting them late winter. We compared it with switchgrass, which has been a favored bioenergy crop, but generally the yields we obtained with switchgrass were quite a bit lower than with, with the miscanthus, although that's not to say that switchgrass doesn't have a role. Um, this is just showing biomass accumulation over the growing season for miscanthus and for switchgrass. But the important thing is that Miscanthus is putting a lot of biomass into the soil. So we've now got farmers interested in this for restoring their soil carbon. Now, of course, well, Champaign County gets some of the highest maize yields in the world. So one of my graduate students, Frank Doleman, and now works for Monsanto, was curious about, well, is Miscanthus really better than maize? And he found it was indeed. And the reason was again, if you look at solar radiation over the growing season, this is what a modern maize cultivar is capturing. And this is what miscanthus is capturing. And that's because miscanthus produces functional leaves earlier and can maintain them later. And so it captures about 60% more sunlight. And then if we look at the amount of biomass plotted against intercepted radiation, that tells us the efficiency with, these, with which these crops convert the intercepted sunlight into biomass. And you can see that this is maize, this is miscanthus. These lines are almost identical. So the difference is really that maize can, sorry, miscanthus can just do it for more of the year. It can do it in colder weather um, than maize can. Now it isn't just that you can get a good yield in central Illinois. These are some of the European trials we had. This is on the west coast of Ireland. This is on land which historically we know has never been ploughed, never been used apparently for food crop. So and yet that's a 72 horsepower tractor and there is our miscanthus crop. So it can grow on marginal soils very successfully. Uh, Fernando Miguez, who's now also a professor at Iowa State, was a postdoc with me, developed a mechanistic model, a very detailed model to really predict where we might get good yields in the US, rain-fed yields. And you can see that it isn't just on these fertile soils of the Midwest, but also through um, into much poorer soils in Georgia, um, Tennessee, um, Alabama, and so on. Indeed, we, Tom Voigt, a colleague of mine, Tom Voigt, an agronomist, now has trials there which seem to suggest that that is correct. So what could you do with this in terms of bioenergy in the United States? How much land would you need? Well, this is these brown areas are the areas that we now use for our 
primary, if you like, maize are row crops. So most of it, of course, is in the Midwest, Mississippi Valley, and then right out here in the Central Valley as well. A lot of this land, if you had looked, drawn this map 100 years ago, a lot of this land would have also been in row crops, including parts of western New York State, which are not, not today. So we have a lot of land which has dropped out of productivity, production that could be used. So if, if you take this square as the amount of the United States that we use for row crops today, 176 million hectares, out of almost 1,000 million in the 48 states. So about 17% um, is in row crop production. How much would we need to reach this um, goal, which was to produce about a third of liquid fuel production? The, the liquid fuels we need produce about a third of them by 2030. For a crop like miscanthus, you would need 9.7 million hectares. We have 11 million in CRP. And of course, it doesn't just have to be miscanthus. You could also think of crops like agave, which can grow on semi-arid land as well. You'd need more hectares, but we have a lot of semi-arid land, which is really in quite poor condition. Um, a lot of it degraded by early settlement, where you could even restore soil carbon. So it really wouldn't be a large burden on the amount of land we would need to do this. And then we also have the situation where producing about 110 million tons of pulp, which is declining in its need because we're um, moving more and more to media like this. Demand for pulp is, is declining, although apparently some uses are still not going away. Um, so we have those opportunities. And I just want to finish on biofuels by saying that there are opportunities beyond cellulosic ethanol as well. Um, RPRE, which is a branch of the Department of Energy, put out a call for some high-risk proposals. So together with Brookhaven National Lab, University of Nebraska and uh, University of Florida, we put together a proposal where we said, well, sugarcane and sweet sorghum are among the most productive plants we have. Supposing we could get them to accumulate oil in the stem instead of sugar, um, because you would get far more oil per hectare than you could get from canola or soybean. And so we set about trying to do this, and it was a test of concept, but in two years we've managed to get accumulation of oil in the stem of about 5%. We've identified late stem promoters to attach the constructs to. And we've also engineered photosynthesis in these plants to get more productivity. And we've, um, and a separate line has been hybridizing sugarcane with miscanthus, their close relatives, to try and um, breed in improved cold tolerance. Um, but these, the engineering ones have moved quite quickly. This obviously requires a lot of back crosses before you can really get back your original cane. And so, so I realize this is too small to see, but this is how much biodiesel you could get per unit of land area. This is what we get today from soybean. This is what you can get from the cane we have now with 5% oil. This is what you get if we reach the theoretical target i.e. all the sugar ends up in oil, which would be about 20% of the biomass in, in oil. And on this map, what you're seeing is yellow is land which has been abandoned from agriculture, uh, but could be used for growing sugar cane. So if we were to grow an oil cane like this on that land, it's about 23 million acres, about 10 million hectares, that would be about 69% of that 2030 goal. So I'd really say that 
it is possible for the United States to produce a very significant amount of biofuel renewable uh, by 2030, definitely by 2050, um, if we wanted to do it. Now, of course, a lot of what I've been telling you is transgenic technology. So, you know, what is inhibiting us really from adapting this? One is doubt that we really need to, to worry about food production because Malthus was a, um, a, a vicar in Britain over 200 years ago who showed mathematically populations rising exponentially, yield is rising linearly, a point will come when starvation happens. He forecast that point about 200 years ago and we've managed to avoid him pretty well. Um, we did reach a point before the Green Revolution where it did look iffy, but that was overcome. And it's been overcome because we've had a series of agricultural innovations of which the Green Revolution was one. The, we forget that going back 150 years ago, the Haber process, which is where basically originally coal was burnt to get temperatures where you could convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia, the, the source of most of our nitrogen fertilizers today, probably allowing about 4 billion more individuals on the planet. But I put it to you, if the Haber process was invented today, would society be willing to accept this dirty technology despite the huge impact it's had on food production? Um, and then, of course, today we have the availability of information and disinformation, which makes communication of science critical. And I think GMOs are really a classic case where there's been a complete failure in communication because anyone with a reasonable knowledge of plant genetics will realize that taking one gene and putting it into a known location in the genome um, is a much safer technology than what we were doing before which was if you like for example taking a wild relative to get to get a gene for disease resistance productivity whatever crossing that into our crop, then back crossing several times. We get our known gene in, but we also end up with many other genes whose function we have often no idea about. They could be allergens, they could even be carcinogens, but that's, we class that as natural and acceptable, yet the far more precise technology is really um, not gaining much acceptability, at least in many areas of the world. Um, and yet, at the same time, pretty well all of, all of today's insulin comes from genetically modified organisms and somehow that's been accepted. And then I think it isn't just our failure to communicate to the electorate at large, but to politicians. We've, for example, um, Florida became worried about new bioenergy crops potentially becoming invasive. So it passed a law saying that if, you, if you're going to trial one of these bioenergy crops, you have to take out a bond of several million dollars in case it escapes. But there's a clause in the legislation which says, but if you're using the plant for agriculture, you're exempt. So to a biologist, it makes no sense. If a plant's going to be invasive, it's going to be invasive whatever your purpose. And then we have the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which uh, would not accept ethanol from, made from maize, but will accept ethanol made from sugarcane. So we had a year when Brazil ran short of ethanol. It imported ethanol from the United States. And California imported ethanol back from Brazil because that was considered sustainable. So apparently, some molecules of ethanol are different to other molecules of ethanol. So, um, but we are seeing things changing. Um, some of the opponents of GM crops have changed their position quite, and our proponents. Um, so what I put to you is from a scientific perspective, we could have it all in 2050, 
whether policy and society will allow us, you know, will the perfect be the enemy of the good in this situation? Um, we don't know. And if you want to know more about these projects, um, there are two websites, ripeillinois.edu and petrosillinois.edu. And these are some of the many people who've worked in my lab and um, made it possible to give that presentation. So thank you. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.